Good afternoon, and welcome to the eighth uh, George G. Graham Annual Lectureship here at Johns Hopkins. It's really a pleasure to have all of you here, and it's wonderful to see uh, so many uh, attending the lecture. We have a special program today. In fact, we have a special program for each Graham Lectureship. This one uh, deals specifically with the long shadow of the Dutch famine, we have Dr. L. H. Lumet from Columbia University and Dr. Richard Hall from Baltimore, two very special guests who will be introduced separately. I'd like to recognize the Mittendorf Foundation for supporting this lectureship in addition to the International Child Nutrition Fund and Dr. and Mrs. T. C. Uh, and Lee Wu. This lectureship is named after Professor George G. Graham. George was the founder of our program in human nutrition here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he was a professor of pediatrics and international health. He started our program in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, he was visionary in recognizing the need for nutrition and international health to be combined. He was founding director of the Institute of Nutrition in Lima, Peru, which is the uh, leading nutrition research institute in Latin America, uh, and has enjoyed a, a very long relationship uh, with Johns Hopkins. We have researchers that come and go to the Instituto on a regular basis. George had many appointments. He was on many advisory boards and editorial boards. He was a member of the National Academy of Sciences and. The, uh, and many other professional organizations. He was an awardee of many nutrition awards during his uh, 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 wonderful career. Uh, he was a teacher. He was my personal mentor and that of many uh, uh, students that uh, studied here at Johns Hopkins. He was a uh, prolific writer uh, with a pen and pencil on paper. He could write beautiful papers the first time, uh, and, uh, and was uh, a pioneer uh, in the nutrition area. These are just a few of his selected papers on copper deficiency in infancy in the early 60s. Uh, he published often in the Journal of Nutrition and could actually send the journal papers with num numbered one, two, three, four, five, as if he expected and the journal expected more papers to come that would be accepted for publication, something most of us cannot uh, guarantee in any particular sequence. Uh, he was a pioneer in studying the growth of children and what foods were required to help children grow and to help them recover from malnutrition and what that did to their bodies in terms of body composition, in terms of growth, what kinds of foods were uh, best to give children under conditions of context, uh, whether it's in Lima, Peru, or elsewhere, what foods were available that could best uh, improve the uh, growth of children, especially in poor urban areas where he worked uh, incessantly uh, in Peru. So uh, he has set a standard for all of us in many of his papers continued to be uh, cited today in the uh, nutrition literature. We had the honor of launching a uh, professorship in the name of George uh, back in, in, that became reality in 2005. I have the honor of uh, being that inaugural uh, professor in his name, and it is truly an honor uh, to, to, to be that in that position. Uh, we immediately started to uh, drive toward uh, initiating a lectureship uh, in George's name, which started when the Mittendorf Foundation came forth with a grant and uh, other wonderful uh, folks have come forth to help support this lectureship uh, since then. We've had great lecturers, Ken Brown, who was on the faculty here in the program in 1978 through 84 and an early director in the program following uh, George. Bill McLean, who was on the faculty here in the 70s and early 80s. We had Nevin Scrimshaw and Carl Taylor, 
with Charles Stevenson, Claudio Lanata, and our own Bob Black, who is here somewhere, there he is, uh, speaking about nutrition and infection and its interactions. And that was a particularly wonderful session in uh, 2009 that you can see on our website in the Center for Human Nutrition website, where uh, Nevin and Carl uh, bantered back and forth for nearly an hour sitting here talking about what led them to link nutrition and infection and the interactions that occur when they were publishing their papers in the 50s and the 60s that led to a WHO monograph on nutrition and infection uh, in 1968. We've had Ricardo Huawei talk about growth in children, Andrew Prentice about mechanisms that support nutrition interventions, Michael Golden, who is a pioneer in solving problems in severe malnutrition in very much his own way, uh, and last year we had Bruce Ames uh, talking about micronutrients and aging and how to protect yourself to at least 100 years of age. Uh, and uh, he was also quite provocative. Uh, those who are unaware of history are destined to repeat it. Uh, and uh, paraphrased, you can't know where you're going until you know where you've been. And in many ways that reflects the a theme of today's uh, lecture, that uh, we need to understand the famines that have occurred uh, and why they occurred and what the consequences are so that we can better perhaps prevent them in the future. Uh, the uh, 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 1991 inter, uh, interna International Conference on Nutrition said that by the, the uh, year 2000 that we would eliminate famine. Well, that probably has not happened. It ha certainly didn't happen in the next 10 years, and there's plenty of reasons for it to continue. But if we understand why it happens and what its consequences are, perhaps we stand a chance at stopping famine in the future. So we have a wonderful program today uh, that will, uh, I think, enlighten us both scientifically and in terms of living history. Uh, of what went on there uh, 70 years ago uh, at this time of the year. I'd like to now introduce our esteemed and beloved dean, Mike Clagg. What does he want? What does he want? Uh, I, you know, a school grant, uh, innovation award. Uh, who's uh, going to come to the microphone? He's already here. And uh, introduce our first speaker, Dean Clagg. And here, th this is a pointer that you can use. And uh, you can a, take down jet planes with this. Yeah, Don't yeah. do that. Thank you. So, uh, so it's really a pleasure to be here and to play a small part in today's proceedings. And it is, uh, you know, having been to many of those lectures, not all of them, it's really an exciting day that we always look forward to. And I know today's not going to be any different. For those of you who were here earlier, you saw the slides about the, uh, about the Dutch famine. I'm just going to provide a little background about it. Uh, before the lecture begins. So in 1944, uh, after four years of Nazi occupation of, of the Netherlands, it, it appeared that a, there were glimmers of hope that there would be an Allied victory. It seemed only a matter of time before the occupation would come to an end. So the Dutch, uh, in order to aid uh, the, the war effort and cripple German supplies and transport, uh, decided to declare a national uh, railway strike, which they did in September 1944. In retaliation, the Nazis closed down all roads and destroyed docks and bridges, resulting in a complete transport blockade, which, which slowed the Allied advance, but also created a situation where food and supplies could not come into the country, created tremendous uh, food and fuel shortages for the 4.5 uh, million people living in the Netherlands. Over the course of the next few months, which became known as the Hunger Winter, which was an incredibly severe winter in terms of weather, millions of citizens were eventually subsiding on less than 500 kilocals a day. And it's probably everybody in this room knows, it's estimated that we need about 2,000 kilocalories a day to meet our nutritional needs. Sugar beets and tulip bulbs became a food staple. And as many as 22,000 civilians died of malnutrition. Then, May 1st, 1945, the Royal Air Force, along with the U.S. 8th Army Air Corps, broke through the embargo, and we saw some pictures of them li dropping literally tons of food on the Netherlands to the starving people below. 
Known in the U.S. as uh, Operation Chowhound, U.S. forces alone flew nearly 400 B-17 bombers loaded with food supplies in one day. Four days later, the occupation ended, the Netherlands were liberated, and food supplies were immediately restored throughout the country. So now let me tell you about our speaker. We're really pleased and honored to welcome Lambert Bertie LeMay, who's a medical epidemiologist at New York's Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. His primary research interests relate to the use of population cohorts to evaluate the effects over the life course of environmental changes around the time of conception and in early life. We're particularly excited and pleased to have him here today in his role as chief investigator of multiple studies for the 60-year follow-up of the men and women who were born during the Dutch famine of 1944 to 45. These people were exposed to the severe mal malnutrition I just described during uh, their time in utero. Dr. Lumet has reported extensively on the immediate and long-term health differences of prenatal famine exposures, including size at birth and adult body size, lipid profiles, glucose metabolism, and other health outcomes. In 2008, using data from the Dutch famine population, Dr. Lumet published the first study in humans linking prenatal famine exposure to persisting changes in DNA methylation of the IGF-2 gene. So DNA methylation, of course, meaning you silence or turn on genes or turn off genes. And I think he'll tell us about that work today. He studied medicine in Leiden and Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and philosophy of science in Cambridge, England. He received a Fulbright Fellowship to study epidemiology at Columbia University. As a Lorentz Fellow of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Science, Dr. LeMay organized the first international workshop on the long-term exposure to famine in 2008. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lambert Bertie LeMay to Johns Hopkins and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Ladies and gentlemen, um, esteemed Dean, um, thank you for your gracious introduction. I'm very honored to present the George Graham um, inaugural, the eighth um, award. Uh, I see it as a, uh, a sign of um, very focused interest on the part of the faculty for the events that went on in Holland and also for um, the relevance our studies may have to um, studies of nutrition. And I'm very pleased to tell you about them in a little more detail. The, um, my talk will serve also as an illustration that sometimes if you set out to study certain phenomena, over time the focus of interest in the study changes and you find that you are trying to address questions with your study that were not part of the original study design. As an example, um, I started the study um, to directly, from a historical perspective, look at the impact of the study because my professor of obstetrics in Amsterdam was convinced that maybe women who were conceived in the famine uh, later, when they had their own infants, would show differences in birth weight. The infants would show differences in birth weight depending on whether they themselves had been exposed to famine in utero. And because of the prevailing system in the hospital, it was possible for me to pull some of those records. I think currently the interest in the famine studies is not so much uh, primarily on the historical events, but m much more so on what the famine can tell us about um, long-term impact of changes in the environment. So if, if seen in the context of the, um, the fetal programming, fetal origins hypothesis, it seems to me, and we've demonstrated to some extent, that 
Um, we happen to have data collected that bear on this question and that allow us to say, in a very extreme nutrition exposure situation, um, what is likely to happen? And um, if so, maybe we can derive some insights in terms of the, the timing of the impact, the duration of the impact, the follow-up, and um, compare this with other studies in, that go on from the biological point of view, from the laboratory point of view, for which uh, human populations are more difficult to assemble. So to repeat my notion, we have, um, I'll use this, we'll have a sustained interest from the more general perspective of programming that um, particular outcomes, and the focus has been on obesity and maybe glucose, could be driven by changes in the environment, people say usually in the, in the prenatal period. And in the first level of analysis, one would then try and make a correlation between the outcome and the event, the exposure, and say if we find a statistical relation between this and that, maybe they are related. Of course, then the lab people say, this is epidemiology, you have to be more than that. You have to have some biology, you have to um, make a plausible pathway. And fortunately, we have many technologies now that allow us to look at ways the DNA is modulated um, with the silencing or the um, activation of potential of the genes so we can look at DNA changes. So our picture gets to be a little more comprehensive because we can look at a well-defined exposure in the famine, we can look at epigenetic changes, we can look at phenotypes in terms of um, glucose metabolism, adult disease, and we can try and um, elucidate potential pathways that then can be followed up in laboratory studies and other studies. So I see this study as part of a mosaic, as part of a picture that will help other people develop and test and uh, expand our notion. It's a, it will not give all the answers, but it's an interesting and very comprehensive population setting that can at least maybe debunk some notions and generate some other notions. The, um, I'm going to focus on the Dutch famine studies here. We've done other studies in other settings based on um, historic records that relate survival in Finland, in Sweden, of people exposed to famines in the 19th century, where we have the records from the famine, and where we can look at, because of the very advanced demographic data, we can look at the survival. As you know, there are very large famines in the, in the Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, in 1932-33. We were, we were looking at that, comparing diabetes outcomes in people who were exposed and non-exposed because of the war conditions outside of their own volition. After World War II, there were very poor nutrition conditions in Germany in 46-47, and of course, uh, we have Mao's famine in China that also had a terrible impact. I've, I've not mentioned any of the famines in, in Bangladesh that Keith is familiar with. Um, I may have been biased uh, to some extent because I could find some exposure um, reliable data and outcome reliable data in these settings. Um, so this is, I'll focus on the middle aspect of, of this mosaic of famine studies, and um, that will be in the Netherlands. So this is a picture of the live births in the Netherlands covering the period between 1940 and 1946. And as you can see, the live births per thousand per year, there's some seasonal stuff, an enormous dip here, and an enormous overshoot. The enormous dip is the drop in conceptions at the height of the famine. And the enormous overshoot is after liberation, when people were, had their food, their, their husbands came back, everyone was in a good mood. And <laughs> this is, our, this is our, um, our baby boom era for the Dutch, um, in the Dutch demographic setting. 
the top scale here um, refers to the month of conception and the bottom scale refers to the month of birth. So you can see that the conceptions were very below, very low at the end of 1945 and this is the period that coincides with the height of the famine. Geographically, what happened is the follows. The dean has mentioned briefly that um, the western part of the country was inaccessible to the food from uh, the northern and eastern part, inaccessible for the coals for heating from the southern part, and um, the transportation from the countryside where food was to the cities was very disrupted. So we had a railway strike, we had limited... Uh, um, defenses, and this situation only ended in the, when the, with the surrender of the German army in 1940, 1945. This is a heroic uh, figure. His name is uh, Dr. Lauer. So he, he may be very, I think he's famous in, in nutrition cycles. He was a W, the uh, World Food Organization Director General after the war. He was in charge of rationing in the Second World War in Holland. The, the, the government, as early as the 1930s, had realized that in the event of an occupation, it would be much better to have most of the yield from the harvests under central command so that it could be redistributed according to need. And it was a very clever... Um, cooperation between nutrition people, psychologists, and others that allowed the system to go in place throughout the war. Now, there was no food shortage in Holland for most of the war because initially uh, even a lot of food was exported to Germany. The Holland did well, but at the, at the famine period, things went down considerably. So what had happened was the following. The government purchased the uh, agricultural yield of the country. They wanted 70% of what the farmers generated under central command. There was an elaborate system of um, identifying the acreage, identifying the yield, and saying, this is what your land should generate according to our system and you're not going to give us less than the land generates. We want, we know you want to sell on the black market. You'll allow to do that, but only 30% of your yield. Six, 70% goes into the central system. So they had an enormous success compared to what happened in, the, in Belgium and France in actually having at the disposal in central warehouses food for distribution. So this reflects, these reflects the rations that were given out to individuals on a weekly basis in central kitchens in, in the larger cities. And people would generate their coupons based on how many people in the family were there to, um, to provide this. So it serves you to see that the dip is very well defined. There's a a, a sudden start, there is a sudden end. It doesn't tell you that um, adverse long-term outcomes are related to X number of calories because we know there was supplemental feeding in the order maybe of 30%, depending on whether you were rich or not, whether you could barter. But certainly the dip was there. And um, for the most people, this serves as a, as a reliable uh, indicator of what actually was available. Some of the pictures you've seen, um, this is uh, one of the planes that were flown by Dick. These are, this is a British plane, a, a, a Lancaster. This is a very famous uh, picture from Holland, from droppings of the foodstuff, the, the, the convoys that came in. And I must tell you, a very early example of photoshopping, <coughs> if you don't tell anyone, here we have a plane that is flying over, and here we have a plane that is flying over with foodstuffs being dropped. But the bomb doors are closed. 
So someone, I tried to identify the person who photoshopped this, but this is the very famous person that goes on over the world. So you see, even at the time, um, visual communication is a very important element of winning the war. We identified in um, some of the hospitals in, in the west of the country that were affected, the hospitals that had not thrown their records away, because as you know, um, you could have a community center, a health hospital, you move to a larger place, you merge with the university, no one cares about the archives, everything is burnt. Um, we were fortunate that we could identify some large hospitals that had kept their records. Um, and we would then have available to us a time series of um, maybe 60 years. So we looked at the, the changes in the birth weight in the Amsterdam University Hospital. These are the months of birth. So you could see the lowest birth weight, end of April 1945. This is the time of the liberation. The background are the nutritional uh, rations. And you can see that the, the, the solid line, the birth weight, went back to normal, this one, within a few weeks of liberation. Very, very fast response. You can also see that people who were conceived at the height of the famine and who therefore would have been born much later, that they showed no changes in birth weight. So one of the lessons we learned from our study is that birth weight itself does not tell you about the severity of the famine. It doesn't tell you about the exposure in terms of the stage of pregnancy. So if you, have, if you do follow-up studies and you relate those to birth weight only, um, you have to be very careful about your inferences. A little complicated, but the basic story here is that if you plot the pregnancies over nine months by, in relation to the time, um, starting in May 44, going all the way out to 46, some infants will have been, this, and this being the severe famine period, some infants would have been exposed at the end of their gestation period, and some infants in the middle, and some infants at the very beginning. And using this, you can sort of make up, um, based on the date of birth of, or date of last menstrual period, you can define the gestation period. So in the first study, we looked at three institutions in the west of the country, uh, midwife schools, two midwife schools and one um, university department. In Holland, um, midwives are very special because they do home deliveries and they are in charge of the physiological, the low-risk deliveries. And the midwife training schools, there are two large schools in Holland and they do thousands of deliveries a day. But the good thing about it is their record keeping is so much better than in any of the medical schools. So we had the two midwife schools, the medical school, and as I explained earlier today to some of you, there is a, um, there's a demographic tracing system that allows you to follow an individual from birth through their different residencies because of a person card that goes with the individual to the most recent address. So if you feed in um, a name and a date of birth in 1944, you go to the registry, say this was, person was born here, then the registry will tell you this person is still living here or this person moved in 1952 to the other town. And if you do enough handwork, that was the largest part of the study. You can follow people. So we followed 97% over 60 years, period. Nowadays, you can do it by computer. We didn't know that. But the we had more detail. We have more information on our individuals. Then you write your you write to your candidates and say, I am writing to you um, with the permission of the chief of service of the hospital where you were born in 1945. 
and we invite you to join our study. And um, maybe about half of the people will respond that they will do that. And then we invited them to come for interviews, medical examinations, and we also asked the women to bring a sister and the men to bring a brother. Because our idea was that we would then have triads, meaning we would have a woman under two conditions. We would have two pregnancies for each woman, and we would then compare the outcome in the first girl with the outcome in the second girl, one of the girls being exposed to famine in gestation and the other not. And this would allow us to account for some of the genetic variability and account for some of the common aspects of the family and for the same of the boys. So this is uh, the number we ended up with, about a 1,000 uh, individuals. We have time controls born in the same hospital before and after the famine. We have sibling controls, also non-exposed, but we don't know where they were born. We just know that they are siblings and that they were e exposed, they were um, examined in the same way. <coughs> So at age 57, we look at the various outcomes from the glucose tolerance test. We compare um, impaired fasting glucose, impaired glucose tolerance, both or diabetes mellitus in men and women. And um, there is a suggestion comparing the exposed with the unexposed that uh, the women, especially with respect to diabetes, are more abnormal, have an odds ratio of about a two-fold increase 60 years after their prenatal famine exposure. Taking, and now we do the next step, we compare the individuals with their matched sibling who is not exposed. So this is taking into account some genetic differences. Now first we'll look at the right panel we see that all the bars are up, they're moved up, they're positive. So there is something going on in terms of the body mass index, the fasting glucose, the 2-hour glucose of the glucose tolerance test, the LDL triglycerides and the, uh, the LDL cholesterol and the triglycerides. We compare the outcome at age 50 in these, in these values and then we subtract the value in the famine exposed individual with the value in the non famine exposed individual, the sibling. So, relative to the siblings, the exposed have more elevated BMI and glucose and LDL and triglycerides by maybe a third of a standard deviation. Now, I'm going to explain to you the left panel, which is a double, a double control type of panel. Because you may remember, we had time controls of individuals born before and after the famine. So in our, in our reasoning, these people should be normal. They, didn't, they shouldn't show any famine effect. So if you compare normal people with their unexposed siblings, also normal, that's a double normal, right? So there's no difference here as opposed to here. So our double normals, they pan out the way we think they do. So that was a reassurance for us. It turns out, since we were looking at the diabetes and the body mass index, that the two are very related, as you can see, and that in many studies, if you take into account someone's weight, you can then explain some of the increase in the diabetes by people being overweight to some degree. And in our study, it didn't work that way. If we took into account the weight of the individuals, it would only in part explain their elevated risk of diabetes in the famine exposed. I'm gonna look at my prompter and ask how am I doing time-wise? Do I have 15 minutes? Oh, yes, you have 25. 25, okay.
So this is on the 970 here because we lost 100 in mix up of, not mix up of twos, but some people have the first measure, not the last, so the numbers go down a little bit. So one of our follow-up studies is to, and this is in for funding, we haven't received funding, but that's one of our plans. If the, um, if the impact on diabetes of the famine-exposed individuals is not totally explained by what we know about their obesity, maybe we should look more carefully about the distribution of the adipose tissue because we know there is bad fat, there's good fat in terms of bad fat having adverse effects on glucose, on metabolism, and the visceral fat especially is important. So we were very fortunate that um, the, um, we have collaborators who are specialists in um, um, the analysis of MRI scans. And as, as I can see, you can, the green is the subcutaneous fat, there is the intermuscular fat, there's the visceral adipose tissue, and these are cross sections where you can see the, the long muscles of the back and, and the front, the vertebrae. So you can imagine having cross sections will allow you to um, identify the proportion of visceral fat, the bad fat, and see whether the famine exposure had any effect, not just on the being overweight, but as to where the fat was programmed to go. We were, as a second thing, we were extremely formula, uh, fortunate because our collaborators in Leiden University work very closely with Philips Industries. And Philips makes MRI scanners. And the MRI scanners don't just make two slices, they make 1,200 slices. So you can put someone in the scanner, and then based on 1,200 slices, you can create a 3D picture of an individual and um, tag all the tissues, or remove the subcutaneous fat, or show the uh, visceral adipose tissue that you would want. Uh, this is the omentum, of course, and the intramuscular. And this you can then visualize and calculate to identify to what extent the changes in external fat are maybe driven by minute changes in this component. So that's looking, trying to get at, at the pathway as to how the adipose tissue distribution may modulate and may account for different um, hormone effects. A separate line of research was to, um, to replicate a, a very, very interesting studies in agouti mice where changes in the um, nutrition of the pregnant mother, woman, I don't know how to say this in rat terms. <laughs> yes? Okay, thank you. You can affect the offspring coat by changing, by giving uh, methyl in the, in the mother's nutrition. And you don't have to do um, methylation studies because the um, anatomically and, and physiologically, the change in methylation will translate into a difference in coat, coat color. So we'd say if this is possible in animals, maybe it's possible in individuals as well. Let me see. So this is a report of the study of the, the methylation changes. We looked at this gene, but um, this is the next story is really what it was all about. So we're looking at the, again at the, um, at the sibling design. So we're comparing methylation at a specific locus that is related to growth, to nutrition, and we're seeing is the methylation pattern the same? Is the methylation pattern in the famine-exposed individuals different from the methylation pattern in their siblings not famine exposed, so the same mother. And we arrange the individuals by the date of conception of the exposed person, 
ranging between December 44 and May 45. Here's the dip in nutrition. At this particular locus, the methylation has a number percentage that is 50, 60, 70 percent. And so if we subtract that number within each family, we get a number that is around zero if nothing is going on. So that's your zero. But if we smooth the line, we see that in this famine exposed group that the methylation is five percentage points difference systematically, comparing the exposed with the unexposed. So the exposed have less methylation. Now, of course, since we're epidemiologists, we want a control group. And we do the same analysis in famine-exposed individuals, not exposed in early pregnancy, as in the previous slide, but exposed in late pregnancy. And you can see there's variation, but the average impact is around the zero. And these happen to be the individuals who have low birth weight because of the famine. So we would say, based on birth weight alone, we would get a totally wrong impression. We would not be able to see what is going on when. Some of the studies in these individuals are being continued because we now further integrate um, our insights, not only looking at this particular locus, but doing more extensive genome-wide methylation studies, then trying to condense that information from the 450,000 data points and identify maybe regions in the genome that are particularly sensitive to prenatal impact. And of course, from my point of view, it would then be important to say, well, are these on particular pathways, these changes in the genome that could maybe explain changes in uh, glucose metabolism and these various other aspects. We are a long way from that because it's very difficult to link phenotypes, health outcomes with um, methylation levels at this very small group, but um, that's our way of thinking. So another perspective is to say, step away from the smaller studies where you have all the biological detail and look more at the population level. Do we see across the country, if we can identify individuals with exposure, do they die earlier? Do they die of different diseases? Do they, are they, equally successful in life, those kinds of more general questions. But you need a different study for that. So we, we created the data based on what was available. Um, we want a database where we have data already at some point where we can follow, we have a, a well-defined population that we can follow until they die, where we have uh, standardized measures and in Holland, one of those populations is the military population because all the men in Holland at age 18 were called for health examination for military service. So we take the same country, we take a different population. Um, our database um, includes 400,000 medical records over the year, so we can select from those 400,000 exactly the people who, according to our thinking, were exposed, were in the wrong place in the wrong time, and follow those people. And we found about 25,000 people who were born in the six cities in the West at the wrong time, and we compare them with people born before and after in the same cities, or people born in the liberated areas of Holland here and there, uh, no famine exposure. We followed them through the um, population registers, but now very um, mechanized because you can't do 50,000 people the way we do that. Um, 
and there is a lot we can compare. We, can, uh, we, we have information how healthy they were at age 18, so we can see if the health outcomes at age uh, 60, 65, in any way relate to these measures at age 18. Could we already see at age 18 that something was wrong? Or do we only see it at age 65? Or do we see better outcomes, maybe, if the, um, if the healthier people, if the unhealthier people had died, then we won't be able to see any outcomes because of the selection issue. This is to show you again that if you look at the numbers of military people who are available for exa examination, there's a big hole, a big dip, a big deficit around these times. So it shows that this is the famine impact on the births. So we're only examining these people who, who should have been here are not examined. So that sometimes calls for special, um, special modeling to, to examine what's going on. A long time ago, 40 years ago, uh, at Columbia, these data were used to compare if at age 18, the measures of intelligence, uh, special education, um, whether there was any difference in the famine-exposed military recruits comparing those with famine exposure or not. So we have here the soldiers, the, the recruits at age 18, arranged by their date of birth. And we have manual, non-manual, so the, the, by their father's occupation, and control and famine. So the top two lines are the unexposed group and the famine group among fathers with manual education, the scores. And then the bottom are the famine and control exposed among the non-manual groups. So I never know how the numbers work, but the non-manual would have the, the best outcomes at age 18. But the, the interesting thing is that there would be very little related to famine exposure if you follow this over the time. And the same for these outcomes. This is the Raven score, and these are other scores. So there was no impact at age 18 at the national level of this exposure. A very famous paper that we are now re-examining also looked at body size, looked at um, what they call obesity, but in fact what it is is BMI over 27. And they seem to say, comparing the manual and the non-manual, there was a big increase in obesity among the famine exposed. So this is under further review at age 18. So our work now is to follow the people beyond these first observations to see what their mortality experience is. So I told you we start with 400,000. We take out the people in the wrong place, in the wrong time, the births, the 25,000. We add control groups, and we follow up about 95%, and we have a large number of people traced. And then we arrange the all-cause mortality by the trimester of birth of the gestation. And what we see is maybe a 10% increase in all-cause mortality over this time period. The, the follow-up is through age 62 because the others are still alive. We, so we're only seeing 10% of the cohort. After famine exposure in early gestation, the first um, three months of gestation. The further follow-up, of course, is possible to look at the cause of death because of many studies that um, fetal programming suggests that those with low birth weight have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, increased risk of diabetes. So we would then think in our national population, we don't have the birth weight of the recruits, but the birth weights are the lowest in, in the third trimester exposure. So we can say, do we see something at the population level of these differences? And the answer is we see nothing. We see nothing for cancers. We see nothing for cardiovascular. 
we see things for very poorly defined conditions, meaning external causes of death are um, non-natural causes, suicides, those various conditions, or conditions that have no label on them, that it's like a, a, a leftover conditions. And some of the other natural conditions that we still need to collect more data on because of the limited numbers. So the other natural, ill-defined, not very nice to have an ill-defined group that causes excess mortality, right? Cerebrovascular, liver conditions, and diabetes. Now, diabetes would be very interesting for us because there are many other studies that suggest that maybe diabetes could be a long-term outcome, but we only have a few hundred cases now. So this number, it goes somewhere, but I would want to see it in 10 years' time. And as I suggested, the external causes, very hard to interpret. So sometimes a very simple question with 50,000 people with a national follow-up, you still don't get the answer. You just, what we can say safely is that if anything is going on, it will maximum, the maximum effect size would be in the order of 10%. There's no way there could be a two-fold increase in mortality of a three-fold increase that you might um, conclude based on a smaller study where the variability is larger. So that's maybe a, an appropriate way to frame the answer is that we exclude certain larger impacts and then we would have to think that 10%, if it's true, what would it predict in terms of other conditions in other settings? This is a little complicated. I'm just um, showing this because I'm collaborating with economists. So this is a different world. They are interested in disability, benefits, unemployment, human capital. And because of the setting in Holland, we can link these data to the mortality data and to the other variables. So it's possible to do an econometric study on the more social outcomes, on the, not well-being, but on social integration, on early retirement, on various other components that are more comprehensive than health. And these data are currently being used for that purpose. See, this is what they do. I have no understanding, but it works. <laughs> so I come to the end. Uh, we. In interpreting the data, we started with um, what is the impact of the famine? Was it bad? Was it good? Everyone, of course, knew it was bad. How bad? Um, the, the badder it was, the better you get published. So the initial studies were bad, bad, bad. And then we have some perspective. We, have, uh, we can address some of the biases. We can say there could be maybe me um, a couple of points increase in body mass index. There could be an elevated risk in the order of 1.52 for diabetes. There could be a 10% mortality increase. If this is true, what impact would that have? Or if this applies to other settings, what impact could that have? Um, if these findings apply to um, fetal programming, if this is like an extreme laboratory where you look at starvation um, as the exposure and you and these findings apply to fetal programming, what is then the impact and how would you examine that? So the, the, the focus of the study is shifting to some extent away from the findings to what they mean for other studies, what they mean for biological pathways what they mean for how we can connect the early life, the puberty, the late life, and of course, what happens in the, in the next generation. There's an enormous interest in these studies. Um, so I think from that point of view, we have a responsibility to use the data as we see them to frame the discussion, to focus on issues that we think are important and to um, contextualize many very excessive claims that are being made in the name of 
some particular hypothesis. So um, that's what we try and do, and we hope that we can all learn from that. This is the mother, the queen bee, and uh, it serves as an inspiration in a way because it's a very clear example of how out of a pool of individuals with the same DNA, a specific nutrition at a specific time in the life can generate this queen uh, and make her a queen instead of a worker. I need to acknowledge the collaboration of many, many investigators and um, their attempts to also try and speak the same language because people have their own scientific backgrounds. And, uh, but it's been very rewarding because once people realize that some questions are across disciplines, then they are even more stimulated to try and find some of the answers. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'm very happy to be talking about my work about this. Sure, sure. Let me find a glass of water. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> One could expect that fetal losses would be much higher in famine period, so there'd be some selection that actually, for those that make it to a live birth. Is there any evidence in that uh, yes. scenario? Um, let me answer your question backwards. At 18 years, there's a big hole in the numbers. Um, there is excess um, neonatal mortality, but once you survive to age six months or so, there's not much going on in terms of um, excess mortality. So then going back, more fetal loss, yes. How would you document? You just know that something's going on. So my response to that is to say, to see if we can, um, could we in any way model could we in any way have some assumptions about the types of fetal loss that would not have occurred had there been no famine? And then see what that would, how would that impact our, our findings? Can we make us, so the idea is to, to give people a story that assuming this and that and that, which you may believe or not, this would happen. If we are less extreme, this would happen. And this is where our work with economists gets to be very uh, helpful because they are much more familiar with these counterfactual reasonings and, and uh, the econometric literature that tries to deal with these questions. But so selective survival is an enormous issue. But we may be able to say the likely impact with extreme assumptions is going to be small in relation to the outcome. And in that case, we would be reassured. But if it could be twice as large as the outcome itself, then we're in trouble. So I'm an economist and think a lot about counterfactuals. Oh, there you go. Wonderful. <laughs> Good. I, was, um, I also had the same question looking in that dip and wondering you know, about the, the uh the infants that survived versus those that didn't during the yes, famine period. Yes. And just a simple question about that, if you were to do predictions, is given that you have such detailed data is about um, any kind of data on miscarriage rates. And then I have a second question, um, which is more for clarification, but on your um, graph where you had standard deviations of BMI and other things, yes. and they were slightly higher for the um, famine high, survivors, high. can could you possibly give us an orders of magnitude or a threshold effect? In other words, were they more likely to be obese and so that it really was a negative thing on BMI or is it a minor difference? I mean, it just it's hard to read it just via standard deviations. 
Oh, no, the, the reason I did the standard deviations is to have some sense of um, the magnitude across the different outcomes. But in, in terms of BMI, it's like uh, three, three or four points. So 25 to 27, 25 to 28, 25 to 29, those, those types of shifts. Um, yes, so it could push you over the threshold, but you have more power if you look at the, uh, at the real values, not have a, have a cutoff. So these would be differences that, for an individual, I don't think would matter much. But at the population level, an increase of two or three BMI points, I think, would have impact for, the, for disease uh, frequencies, yes. So I think it's clinically important, the magnitude, we're not. And then your other question was about the uh, stillbirths. Right, if, or if you had any data on, on miscarriages. We have a lot of data, but I wouldn't put any faith in them. Because not even in current societies are miscarriage rates um, reliable. And there's some fabulous studies uh, done at, at Duke where, you, where um, Alan Wilcox looked at miscarriage rates. But he did that because he had preconception women and then he let them conceive and try and conceive, but he would bug them every day and he would monitor and scan and then he would say, hey, you have a baby. I mean, one day, two day, three day. Oh, you lost your baby. Uh -uh. So that sort of study showed the enormous attrition in the very early stages of pregnancy. And if we talk about miscarriage in a clinical sense, we're talking about oh, 15, 20 weeks or even beyond before it's even recognized by the women. Um, so it's a very complicated thing to examine. One of the things that you didn't talk about was the, re the similarity of these events in women having children when the women are grossly obese. And has anybody looked at, since the pregnant woman is communicating with the fetus to across her placenta, has anybody looked at, compared the uh, blood chemistries of a grossly obese woman with a woman who is severely anorexic and therefore probably isn't going to be able to get pregnant? But those are two different ranges of the, uh, of the nutritional spectrum. I don't know from my studies. But I know that um, in terms of the um, adipose tissue distribution, there are very extensive studies of um, overweight individuals who try and lose weight. And then people monitor where they lose the weight. There, there are studies of anorexic individuals who try and gain weight. And there are studies of pregnant women who try and lose weight. So I'm sure that in some of these studies that I think were initially focused on, on body composition and uh, adipose tissue distribution, that there must be um, serra drawn that would allow you to look at this. I wonder, uh, the Barker hypothesis has been around for uh, quite a while. So I wondered how educated the uh, Dutch population is to its effect. And I asked that with a personal basis. Uh, my mother survived famine in World War II, and she's received excellent care here at Johns Hopkins. And she's had detailed analysis of how this affected her and has been able to make changes in her lifestyle and medication so that she's not only disease free from having illness has been able to cure that, but the methylation and the microbiome has also changed. So with that very personal success story of what can be done, I wondered how your study um, accounts for people who might be equally motivated and receive the, that level of, of care or insight into their health? This is a very fundamental question, and it speaks to 
how one can translate epidemiologic findings into clinical practice. Because we have studies on smoking and lung cancer, but most smokers will not get lung cancer. And there are some smokers that do. Um, this is a very extreme example. Um, many of these events are stochastic in that in the long run, the exposure will tend to bring people towards a, an adverse outcome. But it is nearly impossible to say if you had not had the famine, this would not have occurred to you because there are others who went through the famine and show a similar outcome or others who did not go through the famine and who did. So it, it's, a, it's an important question and it, it shows in a way um, the challenge of translating these findings. Um, when I interview, I don't interview now, but when I used to interview uh, women about their experiences, they would say, oh yes, I always had this bad back or my, my teeth were pulled when I was 25 and uh, my sister also, but not my neighbors who had better experiences during the famine. So there's a very strong desire on the part of an individual to make a link between, um, and it's, it's very strongly felt that a particular event was causing an, uh, something that you are unhappy with. But from a scientific point of view, it's, it's nearly impossible to make that link. So in response to your question, I, c I don't know the answer because I would not, I would not be able to say how other people would benefit from the experience that your, that your mother had. If, if maybe I could just ask it the same question differently. Yes. If all the people who were conceived in the first trimester um, and were in the famine yes. at that time got the message that they are at increased risk for diabetes from previous studies. Yes. Yeah. And they decided they were going to take action and make lifestyle changes so they wouldn't develop diabetes, that they were your highly motivated patients. Yes. Wouldn't that affect your data as you march forward and monitor your results? Wouldn't the people who had that extra warning of, that, of their okay. knowledge of their now exposure I understand you better. affect the results of your study? Yes, this is, okay, the, uh, thanks for rephrasing. Um, the awareness about some specific famine exposure impacting on health is not universal. It's not as if everyone knows that they have to do, that they have to change their behavior in a certain way because they were in the famine, no. But if, if it were true that the early exposure generates this, that if this is a real biological thing, then I think your first part of your question is also very right because you could then say in the aggregate, people exposed to that type of exposure are at a high risk for that. So maybe we should maybe focus screening based on when you were born, where you were born, and focus on a risk group. So that's very, that's very true. Well, did you look at siblings born before the famine and then after the famine to see what the differences were? And I'm thinking particularly in terms of the IGF-2 methylation results, if you could see any preconception effects for the later born group of siblings. Yes. Um, The question is whether there are older and younger siblings. And the older sibling will have been exposed to famine as a neonate, as an infant. And the younger sibling would have been born after the war. So in, the, in general, you could say the time control before and after doesn't make a difference. And the answer is no. 
Um, ideally, you would want to have equal numbers of older and younger siblings. Didn't happen in our study. We had maybe um, a 60, 60, 40 mix. Um, so we, we would have to adjust for that. Fortunately, the age difference between the siblings was very small, maybe two years, three years. So for some of our outcomes, in terms of diabetes and obesity, that would be a relatively a small age difference to account for. So it means that the age adjustment didn't make a difference. So the bottom line is we looked at that. Our data was not perfect, but we couldn't find that the one sibling was telling us something else than the other sibling in terms of control. On the mortality questions, um, first of all, thank you. This is really an enlightening, enlightening talk, um, and scientifically very frank. It's nice. It's nice to see what's happening in the follow-up studies. the The causes of mortality that were diffused. What what proportion of those deaths uh, are due to those uh, poorly defined categories? Because there was in Increased risk there. The cardiovascular disease, the cancer didn't isn't turning out. Um, uh, but th w what's in those other causes? Do you, you you mentioned suicide, and there are papers related to schizophrenia in in cohort outcomes. Can you can I'll you take you us a little further answer. down that path? I'll, I'll give you a general answer. The um, the answers on the. You put out a, a recent paper of ours that looks at causes of death. Yeah, your most recent paper. It's right there on the table for anybody who wants and, to pick um, That's on the table on each exit. Now, we were very fortunate because it was the American Journal of Epidemiology, so they want everything. So we say, okay, we, got, we sent them all the tables as an appendix that not part of the article, but you can look them up. So this gives the breakdown of the numbers of the deaths among all categories that have more than 100 deaths out of the 5,000. So maybe you can see patterns there that could be interesting down the road. But at, um, as a more general response, um, there is a relatively large group of undefined causes, um, maybe in the order, I don't know, 5 or 10%. So if you find an elevated risk in there, there's no way you will ever get beyond knowing that they are from unknown <laughs> causes. Um, and then, so we would, the next step then is to see if the demographic pattern of the unknown causes, does that relate to something other in the data, to particular characteristics that are not related to famine, so that we can get some sense. Sometimes the undefined causes are the poorest people with the least health information, those kinds of things. So we're exploring that. Thank you. Uh, the Netherlands has a rather high uh, number of twin births. Um, did you look at identical and fraternal twins in the study as well? And what was the outcome if you did? We have a, st the first clinical study is a thousand deliveries singletons, because I didn't want to de deal with twins. I say, if I find differences, how do you interpret the findings in twins? In the military study, um, the data are not, um, the data are organized not by family, but by the recruit, by the individual, and there are no family identifiers. So we try to construct twins by saying, if someone were born the same day with a father with the same profession in the same village and had a higher rank birth order than the other person going down six levels of identification, we may have a twin or a triplet. And by that algorithm, we estimated that there was maybe one in 80 twin rate, which is more or less consistent with what we would expect. 
So now I'm talking to the twin registry people in Holland. There's an enormous uh, activity by Dorit Bomsma, a very famous person. So I want to talk to her and say, the people in your registry, ask them their military number, and every good soldier will remember their military number, because it's an amalgam of the date of birth and then a number one, two, three, four, five going between zero or between one and 999. So they only have to remember the last three numbers. So if they tell that number, they don't know that I can then link with the 400,000. And then we can do twin studies. But that's the next step. It gives me uh, great pleasure to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Dr. Richard Hall is former vice president of science and technology at McCormick and Company, a company we know well in Baltimore. <clears throat> For those of you who were living in Baltimore up through the early 80s, you could, you could tell what spice was being produced at McCormick uh, every day by just taking a breath of air in the city especially down along the Inner Harbor. Uh, he was a member of its board of directors until retirement in 1988. Uh, Dick graduated from Harvard in 1943, uh, received his master's in 48 and a PhD in 1951, also from our sister school to the north. Uh, he is former president of the International Union of Food Science and Technology and the International Academy of Food Science and Technology. And in that capacity, Dick uh, uh, worked closely with many, many of the nutrition leaders of uh, the past several decades. He is former vice chairman of the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Academy of Sciences, served on the Academy, Academy's committees in various uh, capacities. He's a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement, for the Advancement of Science and a distinguished fellow of the toxo Toxicology Forum. Uh, he's the author and co-author of 80 papers and book chapters in, in science. During World War II, however, uh, he served as navigator on uh, a lead or called Pathfinder crew in the 493rd Bomb Group of the 8th U.S. Army Air Force, flying missions over Germany uh, throughout the war. Uh, he received the Air Medal with four oak leaf clusters and the Distinguished Flying Cross. So he's highly decorated. But the reason he's here right now uh, is because he flew some very special missions uh, and, that I found out about at the last George Graham lectureship uh, uh, in uh, December of 2013. And we were standing and there and, and, and we were chatting and Dick said, Keith, do you, know, do you know what my first nutrition intervention was? I was thinking weaning food, you know, formula, you know, uh, developing a new infant weight scale, you know, in nutrition. He said, no, none of those. I was the lead navigator for the Army Air Force that flew food over Holland to break the Dutch famine of 1945. And my jaw went <laughs> like this. And so um, it became clear that there was convergence about having Dick uh, here with us today uh, and uh, uh, as we commemorate uh, the uh, famine 70 years ago, and to join Bertie in this, uh, in this uh, lectureship today. So without further ado, uh, we would like to invite Dick to come to the microphone and wax on his life.
Yes, I love a glass of water. Well, you've already learned the reason I'm here participating in this program. Um, these remarks concern some unusual later consequences of that participation. <coughs> Sorry. And um, <clears throat> it, it had some unusual turns. Um, Keith mentioned that I was with McCormick and Company for quite some years. Uh, it became apparent. <coughs> <coughs> it became apparent to everyone in U.S. industry, I think, in the '60s that world trade was going global. And that created a particular problem for many industries, of which the flavor industry was one. Uh, international regulations on flavors differed extensively from country to country. Some countries had no regulation at all, although it was apparent they would soon move to have some. Other countries had regulations, and they differed from country to country. They conflicted. Obviously, it was to the industry's interest to use the N-word to reconcile these differences. And so in 1967, an international trade association was formed, the International Organization of the Flavor Industry, the members of which were national trade associations. And um, shortly before the Shortly before the second meeting of this, the board of directors of this new association, the other American, a man named Gene Grisanti, and I decided that it would be a really capital idea to have a um, session the night before with the Dutch chairman, go over the agenda and try to smooth things out and see where people might be coming from and what problems might arise. So we did. We had a delightful dinner at a restaurant in Brussels and um, got through the agenda. And then the conversation drifted on to other topics. Uh, at one point, for some reason, Gene Grisanti, the other American, said, uh, aren't tulip bulbs a big Dutch export? And boy, Tripp, the Dutch chairman, I don't his initials were FHP Trip. I have no idea of his given name. Um, we knew him as Boy, a common Dutch nickname. And um, Trip said, Well, yes, tulip bulbs are our Holland's big biggest dollar earner. Well, it did not take long to exhaust our knowledge of tulip bulbs. And um, the conversation at some point, continued, but Gene Grisanti said, when do the tulips bloom in Holland? And Boy Tripp said, beach me. And I said, well, I can tell you when they bloom. They bloom on or about the 6th of May. And I'm sure Tripp was thinking to himself, I'll get this brash American. And he said, how can you be so sure? And I said, well, it's very simple. In the winter of 1944-45, many of your countrymen in the German-occupied area were starving. And an arrangement was worked out by which the, the RAF and the 8th Air Force were allowed to fly in on a designated course. The Germans allowed us to come in on that at low altitude and drop food parcels. And uh, even if we wandered off course, they promised only to shoot red flares at us. Well, it just happens that uh, on the 6th of May, I was the navigator in the first American plane, and your countrymen spelled out thank you in blooming tulips. So that's how I know when the tulips bloom in Holland. <laughs> boy, boy reached across Boy reached across the table and shook my hand very warmly and said, that shows you never know enough about your friends. I was waiting with a bicycle to pick up some of that food. Well, the story does not end there, but let me insert a, a, um, 
sort of a footnote that I find particularly irritating. The, every military operation has to have a code name. It's just um, re sort of required. It's part of the culture. And the British chose the name Operation Manna, which I thought was very appropriate. Food from the heavens, even though it was only from 200 feet up. Uh, <laughs> but it, it was a good choice. The American code name, I'm embarrassed to say, was Operation Chowhound. <laughs> now, it would be very difficult to think of a less appropriate or more insensitive name <laughs> for the mission than that was. And that um, simply confirmed my longstanding impression that the best oxymoron in the English language is the term military intelligence. <laughs> um, at any rate, um, the story really doesn't end there because we decided after several years in 1970 that it was time to begin educating European regulators on the particular problems of regulating food, food flavors, flavoring ingredients. And that is difficult because flavoring ingredients are a strange group of substances. They constitute more than three quarters of the substances we intentionally add to food. Yet the amount used is so small that the mean, the mean annual per capita intake of flavoring ingredients is less than two milligrams. So it's a strange situation and most ingredients occur naturally in food. Only a handful are totally synthetic, uh, and they are used in food to accentuate flavor or to replace that lost in food processing or home preparation. In any event, we decided to have this conference, and the problem was to get European regulators to attend, because much more than in this country, the regulatory structure keeps its distance from uh, industry. Uh, there's a considerable residue of suspicion there. And um, Dole, uh, sorry, uh, Tripp had a wonderful idea. He persuaded a fellow Dutchman, a well-known nutritionist, Professor Doles, to chair the meeting. Well, Doles was well-known. He was the, he had just retired as chair of Codex Alimentarius, which is a FAO-sponsored, WHO-sponsored, international food standards setting organization. Well, with Dole's chair, the regulators had to come, and they did. And we had followed the same procedure we had followed three years previously. We, um, uh, Dole, uh, Tripp and I, had a meeting before uh, lunch on the French side of Lake Geneva the day before the meeting in order to go over the agenda and try to see how uh, we could best present the information we had with, and achieve the understanding of the regulators. Something Tripp said during that lunch, no, something Dole said during that lunch reminded Tripp of this story from several years earlier. And uh, Tripp proceeded to tell Dole's about it. And when uh, he finished, Dole smiled and said, well, that shows what a very small world we live in. He said, you were the navigator on the first American plane. You were waiting with your bicycle. I was the chairman of the Dutch committee that negotiated the whole thing with the Germans. <laughs> well, that's pretty much my story. I had no idea. I, I was fascinated by uh, Dr. Lumet's um, discussion. I had no idea that uh, we were following the second and third generation effects. There was a French naturalist, uh, Jean-Pierre, no, Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, who in the early part of the 19th century postulated that uh, acquired characteristics could be inherited. And of course, as evolution 
took hold and genetics, that notion was roundly denied. Well, it turns out that Lamarck was probably right, although he had no idea why. And uh, that lends, at least to me, the fascination that is inherent in the subject about which we had such an excellent presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, and I, I enjoyed the meeting very much. Well, Dick, we're not going to quite let you off the hook that easily. Uh, we have a few chairs here, and we thought we would invite uh, Dr. Lumet and Dr. Hall to sit up here for just a few minutes and, and uh, field any additional questions that, might, that you might have um, to each other, uh, as well as uh, uh, from, from, the, from the audience. So uh, we're going to move these chairs. So if we got our microphones. Uh, so um, we have science and we have history, uh, all on the stage right here at the same time. And, and both, both of our individuals, individuals uh, and both of our guests, it is not beyond us that, uh, Berti, that you're from Holland as well. So you carry a, a, a legitimacy as well uh, uh, on, uh, about this topic. Um, but we thought we would open it up to any questions that you might have uh, from anyone uh, to provoke or stimulate further discussion. Any other World War II vets? age 22 that we're now falling into their 80s. And, um, and you know, uh, I remember meeting David Barker at a kidney disease meeting. Uh, and he was in a room. I just happened to be walking by. And there were four people in the room. And the Barker hypothesis, everybody knows, is the, is the hypothesis which you're testing about fetal programming. And um, he's a remarkable guy because, you know, I had the sense that he could he felt that in your life determined what car you drove at age 50. I mean, he, it was such a, he had, I think, such a deterministic view that uh, off-put people, I think, because uh, he felt, for example, that the, the, in 1968, cardiovascular, coronary heart disease mortality peaked in the U.S. and has been falling ever since. And he felt strongly that that was due to in utero exposure and had nothing to do with smoking cessation and things like that. So, so you, on the other hand, um, seem to me to take a much softer view, uh, to, uh, uh, I won't say softer, uh, a, a more open view as to what, what the magnitude of these effects are. And, and so I'd like you to reflect on, on Barker, who, who as a pioneer and advocate had to be strong, right? Uh, but, but where you think this is going to settle out in terms of how important, uh, what's the, what, the magnitude of these in, the effect of the uh, of the in, uh, euro exposures. How how important are these effects? And you sort of heard it from here. You know how um, you know she was asking how deterministic, right, in a sense, and how malleable these effects. Are. Mario, this is a simple question. <laughs> David Barker sat down in my living room um, because I had um, talked to him and said, let's use the Dutch famine to test some of your hypotheses. And we had a very spirited discussion and we submitted grants together. Um, but I got the impression that you also got is that his role in um, the development of a hypothesis is to, I think, be passionate, to be, um, to use the data to bring a certain idea on the map. And he would not let any data stand in the way of his theory. <laughs> now I say that 
with two meanings. One, because in a way no scientist lets data stand in the way of his theory. I acknowledge that in the best processes, we sift, we look all the time, and um, it's part of the scientific enterprise to be carried away by your own convictions. And sometimes only other people will be able to do that. I don't think there are single experiments that refute your idea. I don't think there are single experiments that put an idea on the map. So I say it in jest to some extent, but he, his role was very strong as an advocate, and he was the, pers the perfect person to do that because of his personality and because of his convictions. Um, what is needed, I think, is the response. You go one end on the pendulum, and then, okay, if this is true, what would be the implications on mortality? Would we be able to see any of these events? Would it not have enormous implications for developing countries? Um, but if you have a certain generation of scientists who, on the basis of this notion, would feel very comfortable to recommend to the governments in India and other places that because of the fetal programming, there will be X percent increase in cardiovascular disease in the generation that has experienced um, starvation and poor conditions in utero. I think that that is a scientific agenda that is not based on data because we have very few data. Um, so he, as you say, he would be a proponent of a certain, um, certain personalities in science we know very well who are important. I'm probably a proponent of the extreme opposite in that I'm curious and I know that people are extremely interested in making these connections, but um, uh, my perspective is let's see if we find some correlations before we explain what is going on. So you hit the the nail on the head. We, we couldn't be more opposite in that respect. We have a question from Professor David Page. Um, thank you for the uh, presentation. Would it be helpful to think of this issue as the dean raises it in, in terms of um, looking at the differential patterns of weight and low birth weight, particularly during the tri first trimester, the different patterns uh, with regard to critical periods during that pattern and the impact of specific as well as uh, broader uh, deficiencies or environmental factors as they relate to this. So that we could see if we followed the timeline as an example through the embryonic period, we would see different congenital anomalies and different impact which are observable or not observable even given your area of mortality and morbidity that can't be recognized or remains unrecognized. But the point uh, with respect to the question raised is we have these very discrete periods and the issues of risk which are not moving uh, through time but at, are very uh, critical in a particular moment. And therefore the results of such an insult would have a differential outcome both in the short term, intermediate and long term. This is very true. So um, in our studies, we, we try and combine the different approaches because um, since we have the, the particular nutrition exposure and for many people also the birth weight, we can say, is there an eddy? What is the relation of the outcome with the birth weight irrespective of the timing? Or is there a differential in the timing? Um, with respect to the birth weight. You understand my point? We can look at the two components. Um, it gets very complicated because even with larger studies, the cells of the comparison, the cell counts, get to be very small very soon. Um, so it would be ideal to have all the variables in one data set so that you can look at the various permutations. But I think for now, um, we would have to focus on formulating specific questions that could relate to an impact on birth weight. 
and an impact of the timing, and then seeing if that helps us any further. I don't think Barca would be opposed in any way to looking at the gestations and the and the and the the, the, the timings, but. In his types of studies, they start with the birth weight as the first measure. So if you if you can find a use for birth weight, then you have thousands of studies all over the world that you can examine. But uh, Barker used a very crude uh, measure. He used uh, five pounds, and uh, he didn't look at issues with respect to fetal growth restriction. I'm saying that uh, respectfully uh, because uh, I think he opened an enormous area for study, but. Uh, he did not uh, look at the discrete issues, and I was wondering in your own work, were you able to uh, develop a, a level of circumscription uh, that would help uh, advance this notion of uh, fetal growth restriction and the timing thereof? No, in, in, our, in our data, because the, no the numbers are too small for that, yeah. one should take out the growth restriction, maybe 5%, 4%, and nothing is left. Yeah. So you need start with millions and then work down your way and maybe you end with a couple of hundred to analyze. Thank you. I'll take this opportunity. Um, Berti, this is me over here. <laughs> uh, the edges of this famine, the beginning and the end, are quite distinct. Uh, and the, the, uh, on each end, there is adequate nutrition. Uh, so there was a quick nutritional rebound. Most famines don't occur that way. Uh, most, there's a, there's a gradual decline in, in, in quality of life and health and nutrition, and uh, market-based famines might take two or three years of gradual uh, decline before uh, the points of inflection hit and, and uh, things get very bad very quickly. And then there is a slow or no recovery for the poor. At, at, once wealth redistributes itself for those who survive, those who have survived the famines of uh, you know, China in 59 and 60 or uh, Bengal of 43 and again in 74 and so forth. Uh, uh, do you think that those uh, exposures where there is no nutritional recovery, no nutritional, no op no opportunity for nutritional rebound, uh, may present a different, a completely different epidemiological profile, although less well defined and and less hard to find beautiful controls uh, that were that that you constructed from the from the Dutch famine. Uh, could you could you reflect on on the differences that you saw? You know, between the Dutch famine and others that you have studied, where the the boundaries are far less well defined and the consequences perhaps uh, extent far extended. I would be I would be speculating a lot. Sure. Because um, we have much less information about the um, gradual changes in nutrition. Um, so even in the Dutch situation, I would be very hesitant to make any statements relating the, um, the nutrition calorie intake with health outcomes um, because we don't know that at the individual level. So you can only make a statement as to that something happened very dramatic with an impact on birth weights, with an impact on conceptions, on births, that could serve a, of a, as a model for a, a prenatal insult of a nutritional nature. And could that hit have any impact later? If so, then we have some sense of a proof of principle if not at all, maybe we should be less convinced that um, there is no recovery or there is no impact. Do you want to say something about that? Isn't there also the difficulty that in the famines uh, that he was discussing, as well as earlier famines in the Far East, Russia, uh, 
um, those are under conditions where uh, population st statistics were less well gathered and the data therefore far more uncertain than in the Dutch example. This is true, but it doesn't, it doesn't always mean that you can say nothing at all. Um, as an example, um, we are working with colleagues in Kiev now on um, the long-term impact of the uh, famine in uh, Ukraine in 1932-1933. So the statistics are not there in terms of birth records and various other things. But addressing a very broad picture, we use different tools. <coughs> We look at the diabetes register today and then we look at whether um, people in the diabetes register, are they more likely to have been born in a certain place in time? And in this particular instance, the geographic regions in the Ukraine, you can divide three regions instead of two as in Holland. There was a Soviet-occupied region with very severe famine. There was a region that was not Ukraine, but part of uh, Poland with no famine, and an intermediate region. So looking over time and looking by gradation, even with incomplete information, if the impact is large, you can maybe say, well, this is another piece of information that bears on this question. So I wouldn't necessarily say just because we have no records, because even if you have a record, you, you still have to interpret what it means, whether it's relevant, who fills in the record, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know about those things. So conceivably, it's possible to look at more chronic exposures over longer time periods. It's possible, but someone would have to say, "This is an answer." If you had an answer, that would be very important to me, and that would maybe. Um, help me in doing certain policies or not. Can I follow up on that? Yes, you can. Carol Graham. Um, so I, it's a question f um, for maybe both of you because I, I was reflecting when you had your birth rate, your birth weights, how they jumped up. But you have to put the sorry, microphone up. How the birth weights jumped up so very quickly, you know, this sort of rapid famine shock versus a chronic one. Um, and I said to Keith, that, you know, that's really amazing. You know, how did they recover so quickly? And he, s he made a comment that I wasn't able to follow up, and he said, well, those are s fat babies versus other kinds of growth. A particular kind of growth from being deprived, I guess, and then all of a sudden gaining weight quickly. And at the same time, all the effects that you seem to identify um, in terms of longer-term outcomes seem to be from the first trimester sort of deprivation. So is there a potential link between being deprived in the first trimester and then this rapid recovery that may accentuate some of these potential health consequences? I don't know. It just strikes me, and particularly listening to Keith's last question. You would have to think, you would have to assume, as a, I think as a scientific question, that <coughs> Maybe the people who were exposed to the famine um, differed in other respects too. If their parents gave them more to eat after they were born because of the memory of the famine, would that make them any different compared to their comparison group so that you would be measuring this parental intervention in addition to the prenatal intervention? All these kinds of scenarios you'd have to think about and say, well, what do we know about uh, parental intervention in those early years? What possible could have been the impact of that from the rest of our studies? What is the likely effect that we would have to account for? And then compare your observed data in the famine exposed with the noise that is generated by the parental compensation, as it were, and then try and weave your way through these various scenarios. And I think then, you, I'm sure you, in industry, you have the same kind of conceptions where you say, everyone says, what about that, what about that, what about that? You should be able to put 
some in the categories noise, some in the categories maybe, some in the categories if so, large effect, some of the categories if so, small effect, and then come to some reasoned assessment, evaluation of what's going on. Okay, we'll take one more question over there. Oh, there's one. Yes. Okay. Thank you both very much. And I want to take advantage of you both being here to ask a question that I'm not sure has ever been answered. What was the nature of the nutritional um, supplies that were dropped, I'm sorry to say, Dick, in Operation Chowhound? Because I imagine it would be probably considerably different from how we might intervene today based on perhaps our not so good knowledge of what would be appropriate supplemental emergency nutrition. I would like to think that the situation was as well thought through as your question implies. I, I, my impression, and it's only that because I didn't look inside the packages we dropped. <laughs> My impression is that it was basic foodstuffs, things that were easily available in England during the war, and food was tightly rationed there. I think probably some uh, military food preparations were included, things like K rations and so on, and C rations. But um, I don't think it, I, I very much doubt any nutritionists were consulted <laughs> in what was done. According to the lore, um, it's the the Swedish supplies of uh, white bread. So that's not very healthy. Chocolate droppings, I guess that is that would help. There's, there's one more question, I think. Thank you both for a wonderful lecture and wonderful stories. Um, I was wondering, because low birth weight is a crude measure for in utero stress, and it has many pathways, it could be nutritional, it could be smoking or psychosocial stress. And it seems to me that during the Dutch famine, those people were not suffering just from severe nutritional stress, but also psychosocial stress associated with the war. And not having lived through the war, I can only begin to imagine. But then with the, the end of the famine, that also coincided with the end of the occupation. And so how do you begin to tease out those different kinds of stress? And has anybody tried to look at controls that don't have the famine but have the, the stress of war? This is a good question. So we're looking at the package that includes stress and nutrition, obviously. So if I were to do a stress study, um, the stress people would kill me because they say, you know nothing about stress. <laughs> <laughs> we try to look, um, some psychiatrists have tried to look at this by looking at, um, to do a famine study in a stress environment, in other words, there was a, um, a non, um, 1953, there was a big, uh, a, a, the breaking of dikes because of the flooding in, in Zeeland. So 1,500 people died and it generated enormous stress, but no famine. So people have said, wh what if we follow these people? Can we see any difference? So that has been stunned and attempts were made to separate the two. But by and large, um, earlier today I was talking to one of your colleagues who suggested that maybe um, in terms of um, methylation impact, the pathway of a stress and the pathway of low nutrition in rodents could be similar. I don't, I don't think there is any way you can separate out 
the very difficult to quantify stress factors from the uh, more easily quantified uh, calorie and, and other factors. Uh, I agree. Well, uh, we wish to thank you both uh, very much for a wonderful lectureship. So we wish to you can. <laughs> wish to also acknowledge um, Dr. Graham's family, who is here in abundance. So we're delighted to see Carol. Uh, George's daughter and Alec, his son and daughter-in-law, Laurie, and grandchildren, Adrian and Anna, here as well. So thank you for coming today. And thank you for your grandfather. Um, we also have a few things, uh, so don't go anywhere, uh, uh, to wrap up. Before we go to a, I don't know, the, you know, we have a reception, a very nice reception after talking about famine after the... <laughs> for the past few hours. So uh, talk about nutritional rebound. <laughs> uh, we're gonna have a nutritional rebound in just a few minutes. Uh, but we wish to uh, invite Dean Clagg up here just to uh, give a few things to our speakers. You don't have to open it up, but in the past 24 hours, uh, in discussions with both Dick and Bertie, at several points in time, we've been looking for pens and papers to write something down, and <laughs> and never have that. You know, the so uh, so that's what we have. Yes, you can give. <laughs> Oh, there goes the $200 pen. <laughs> it comes with a 24-day guarantee, so we're all right. <laughs> but not if it's broken. <laughs> we also uh, would like to invite uh, Dr. TC and Mrs. Li Wu up here to the stage. Oh, no, we're surprising you right now. Come over here. Come on over here. Right there. Uh, this is just in recognition for dedication, service, and a very, very generous heart to the Graham lectureship, to the Graham professorship, and to the research that has uh, that Lee has been carrying out over the past. Uh, 20 years on our research team, just a remarkable biostatistician uh, and a remarkable uh, uh, human being. And Dr. T.C. Wu is a phenomenal human being with a generous heart. And so we just wanted to give you a little uh, token of our appreciation uh, today. So you want to read the inscription here? I, I, I don't have my bifocals on. So, uh, so I'll read it. Uh, so it's got the school logo, and it says, to Dr. T.C. and Mrs. Lee Wu, with great appreciation, George C. Graham Professorship Endowment, February 9, 2015. So there you go. <laughs> So at this point, uh, we uh, conclude the ceremony, uh, con conclude the lectureship, and begin the reception. It's in the Anabacha room right around to the left, uh, and there's plenty of food to just relieve ourselves of this famine <laughs> thinking. To the, right. to, to the right and then to the left. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much.